am excited to spend some time with you this morning thinking about Jesus, thinking about what a great Savior and remembering his death and burial and resurrection. Uh, There's a congregation down in Tampa that calls this period of time the eulogy. And uh, and I love that in a lot of ways because it's that idea of we're gathered together to, to remember and to memorialize and to be thankful for what Jesus has done. Uh, but I also don't like it because we tend to think of eulogies as being a sad occasion. You know, when we talk about eulogies with funerals, those are generally times for weeping and tears and Uh, And ultimately, what we have here is not just a time for remembering the death, but remembering the victory. And that is such a great thing we have as Christians, that death for us isn't sadness, but death is victory. And we see that particularly with Jesus and the things that we uh, learn about him. I want to spend some time this morning, as we talk about the Lord's Supper and we talk about the things that we do Uh, around this table, I want to spend some time just talking about the greatness of Jesus. We've already, uh, Larry read for us Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. I want to read that to you out of a paraphrase called the message, Uh, but then I want to kind of pick it apart a little bit this morning as we think about Jesus. Here's what this paraphrase says. I I, I view this kind of like a commentary, but it's It words some things in there in a way that might make you think about the passage. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Colossians 1. Follow along, kind of compare what you read in your Bible to what we're going to read here in in this paraphrase. But Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15 in the paraphrase, says, We look at this sun and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this sun and see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning, and leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, above everyone. So spacious is he, so expansive, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmony, all because of his death, his blood, that poured down from the cross. While that's not word-for-word scripture, it is thought-for-thought. This idea that we have a God, a Savior, who is supreme above everything. And because of that, we can be continually devoted to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayer. We can gather together as God's people week after week and not find redundancy and not find a a time where we grow bored because we're doing all that stuff again we can be excited because we're gathering together to remember a Lord who is so great, who is so in everything and in charge of everything and holds everything together that he is worth thinking about continually. And that's why it is great that we can gather together week after week and and celebrate this Lord's Supper. We have a Savior who is worth celebrating. We have a Jesus, a Lord, who is worth coming together and remembering the details of his life and remembering the ministry that he did on earth for those years that he was here. And we can remember the suffering that he endured in our place. And we can remember the time that he comes out of the grave and there is rejoicing and there's excitement because 
He is the firstborn from the resurrection, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I want to pick this passage apart a little bit as we spend some time thinking about Jesus and before we spend some time worshiping Jesus and then taking the emblems of this supper. First piece is right here, right at the beginning of Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, this idea that he is the image of the invisible God. That's a bit of a hard saying. I don't know if you've thought about that idea, but how can you be the image of something that is invisible? How can you be the, the visual representation of something that cannot be seen? And that's the idea here. And I, I think the reason this is the idea expressed for us is because it allows us to see from the very beginning that when we go to the task of describing our Lord, we are coming to a hard task. We are coming to maybe even an impossible task. How can we, as people who are limited in our understanding and limited in our ability to understand who God is and how the spiritual realm works, how can we understand truly who Jesus is? That becomes really difficult. Because Jesus is the image of something we cannot see. He is a representation of something that is beyond our understanding. He is something bigger than us, better than us, more perfect than us. He is all of that and more, but he is still a representative of God. Over in John chapter 1, where John is explaining kind of the introducing his gospel, and you've got what's called, what we call the prologue there, where he talks about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Down in verse 18 of John chapter 1, it talks about how the fact that Jesus came, the Word became flesh, and the reason that's important is because the Word revealed God. When Jesus became flesh, he was, a, he was the one who revealed for us an unseen God. He revealed his character. He revealed his motivation. He revealed his mission. He revealed everything we needed to know about who our Father was. Jesus told his disciples himself, when they asked, show us the Father, he says, have I been with you so long that you still don't get it? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And that's what Paul tells us here in Colossians 1. Jesus is the image of what we could not understand and what we could not see. He puts before us something we can see because without him we had a God we could not see. I love that. I love that this Jesus is so connected to God that he is a picture of who God is. We're told he's the firstborn of creation. There are religious groups out in the world today that have made a big deal about that idea, that Jesus was created because he was the first of all the created, and that's not what's being said here at all. Firstborn was the idea of being preeminent. He is the one who was over all of the others. And so it's not saying that he is himself created. You look at that word in its original language, and what you have is the idea of he is the one who is in front of or before. He is the one who is above all the rest. Jesus is above creation. And in case that weren't clear, it goes on to say the reason we know that. He is the firstborn of all creation for because we understand that because everything was created by him in heaven and on earth the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So if all things have been created by him, through him, and for him, then he himself is not created. 
But I don't want to get distracted in some sort of theological debate and lose the power of what Paul is saying here. Jesus is first. He is above any other thing we know. He takes first place. He belongs on the pedestal. He is the one that our attention should be turned to at all times. We shouldn't be distracted by this world. We shouldn't be distracted by our problems. We shouldn't be distracted by our temptation. Jesus takes first place among all of that. Because all the things, other things that we know were created by him and through him and for him. That's what's great about serving Jesus, is that Jesus gives us the focal point to which we should be looking at all times. He gives us the very thing we should be thinking about. He gives us the very uh, perfect idea that should be in our mind all the time. In today's bulletin article, I talk about our, our adventure this past week with losing our electricity and all the, the, the difficulties that went along with that. And I'll be honest, I, 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 on this end of that little bit of a difficult couple of days, I kind of kicked myself in the rump going, why was I so worried? Like, what, what was such the big deal about not having power a couple of days? Now, I'm saying that now that I'm freshly bathed and I don't smell the way I did smell and I'm not hot all the time. And, uh, you know, it, things are a lot more comfortable now than they were in the early part of last week. But the truth is, even in the midst of the most difficult of all circumstances, when we're struggling and we're fighting with ourselves and we're we're, we're we have a hard time keeping our mind focused on good things and we're, we're wanting to get distracted by the issues or concerns of the world. We want to get upset about pandemics and we want to get upset about government control and we want to get upset about vaccines and masks and we want to get upset about uh, people not getting along and whole groups of people feeling like they're oppressed. And, and we got all of these concerns of life that, that come and they weigh down on us and it's like you can't get away from it. And it, 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 it's like this disaster, this, this wreck that you can't look away from because you know it's horrible, but, but it's just got your attention. What Paul's saying here is Jesus should have your attention. Because all of that mess that we have in this world around us, it doesn't, it doesn't compare to Jesus. He's bigger than all of that. He's better than all of that. All of the best things of this life and even all of the worst things of this life, they are under his control. So we just need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We're told that he is before all things and by him all things hold together. He's before all things, and by him all things hold together. We live in a somewhat chaotic world right now. I forget what it was I was listening to, uh, I think it was yesterday, some podcast, and I listened to too many, and I can't keep track of who says what, but uh, they were talking about how it seems that our world has tailspinned worse than ever, at least in the lifetime of this person who was speaking. He was talking about how it just, you know, it, it's hard not to get focused on just how out of control everything seems to be. And I want you to pay attention to the last part of verse 17. He holds all of it. He's got all of it. I, mean, I, I, I picture this world almost, you know, every, every night when I, I brush Maple's teeth, one of the things that I do, because I don't want her sticking her face down in a sink that none of our kids ever seem to be able to clean out, is 
is I, I get water in my hand and I bring the water to her mouth so that she can, you know, get water in her mouth and be able to rinse her, her mouth out and spit back into the sink. I kind of picture our world like that for Jesus. Jesus, is he's got this, this little handful of water, and we're stressing out because it looks like water's slipping through his fingers, but the truth is it's not. He's got it. He has this under control. In the middle of it, it seems like chaos and disaster, but, but the truth is there is nothing happening right now that Jesus isn't completely in control of. There there is nothing happening in our world that is outside of Jesus' power. Nothing. There is nothing we have to worry about. Our world cannot tailspin out of the control of Jesus. He's got all of it. We get so distracted by the simplest little things I mean, take this memorial meal that we do week after week. How often is it that as the bread is being passed or the cup is being passed and you take that bread and you stick it in your mouth that within 30 seconds you find your mind wandering about something else? Your brain has gotten distracted. You're thinking about other things. You're not really focused in on what Jesus has done. And it might be some worry about life. It might be a grocery list. Oh, i got to remember to pick this up from the store. I don't want to forget. Or, or it might be, what are my kids doing right now? I've got to keep my eyes on them. Or, or there's all sorts of things that distract us away from Jesus. We have a hard time bringing our minds to focus on Jesus for mere minutes once a week. The truth is, there's none of, that, uh, none of the other stuff that matters. And there's none of the other stuff we've got to worry about because we have a Jesus who holds it together. He's also the head of the body, the church. And he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. Again, firstborn meaning the one who has preeminence, the one who goes before, the one who, who, is, who is on the pedestal. He belongs on the pedestal of the church, not us, not elders, not preachers, not some great preacher you love to listen to from some other location. He, he belongs at the head of the church. He is the one who deserves our attention. He is the one who has proven resurrection for us because he resurrected first. He is the one who came back from the dead first to be redeemed and taken up to God, and we get to experience that one day. So he experiences it first. He is our forerunner. He is the one we can have confidence in. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. People struggle with that phrase. What does that mean? What is the fullness of God talking about? Does that mean God's power? Does that mean God's authority? Does that mean God's character? Does that mean that they are one and the same in ways that we don't understand? Yes. I I, I don't know how to answer it any better than that. I mean, God in his completion dwells in Jesus. While I might not be able to understand that, I can appreciate that. While I not, might, not, might not really understand what it means even to be the fullness of God, I, I, I don't have my brain wrapped around the concept of God. I don't fully understand who God is and how his nature exists and how he exists outside of our world and, and how all of that works. I, I, I don't know. But I do know that God is so connected to Jesus that Jesus could say, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And through Jesus, God reconciles everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. 
Here's what's interesting to me about the way all of this is organized. Is that you kind of have this poetic structure to this section of Scripture. It begins with this concept of the image of God, and it ends with the concept of the image of God's fullness. And it goes on to talk about the first of creation, and you've got the first of the resurrection. You've got the cause of creation and the cause of the church, the sustainer of creation, and he's sustainer of the church. That, that Jesus is essentially, when you kind of wrap all of this up, he is the very central figure in everything we know. As a believer, he is the central figure of creation and everything I know physically, and as a believer, he is the central figure of everything I know spiritually. He's everything. And the reason I can know that is because he has reconciled us all through the blood he shed on the cross. I, I love that what Jesus has done for us and what we come together week after week to remember is not merely some story about a man who lived 2,000 years ago. And what we're gathered together to do is not merely to just remember a Jesus or a covenant giver that he had some sort of spiritual benefit to us. What I'm gathered together to remind myself of when we take of this bread and we drink this cup is that he is my everything. That's what this table reminds us of. He's my everything. He is everything I need for life and godliness, as Peter puts it over in 2 Peter 1, verse 3. Jesus is that. Jesus is all I need. He is, he is the one who, who makes everything good. He, he, he's everything. And he's that because he was willing to go to the cross and redeem me from all the messes I had made for myself. And I, and I come and remember that here around this table. It is amazing to me, and I, I hope amazing to you as we've gone through these lessons about the Lord's Supper and, and, and all the things we can be thinking about and all the things that, that it's really supposed to bring to our minds that, that you're like, how in the world how in the world do I not find a way to truly focus the full six minutes it takes to pass this thing out? How is it that I, I have let myself maybe trivialize what is such an important moment in my every single week? Not because it is some obligatory practice that we go through, not because we're commanded never miss the Lord's Supper, but because it is such an opportunity to remember and, and get re-centered on the idea that He is what everything is about. He is the center of everything we should be thinking about, that He is our reason for every hope, that He is the reason we should have no worries or no anxiousness because He is the one who holds it all together. He is that. And this supper is a reminder for us that He is that. We're going to spend some time singing some songs, saying some prayers, reading some scripture. But I want us to spend some time morning and the, and the time we have left really focusing in on what this supper is about and how we can truly dig deeply in our heart to remember who he is 